This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. In each episode, we bring you information, insights, ideas, and interviews from some of the industry's top thought leaders. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic and guide the show. This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. I'm your host, Jamie Wood. Our topic today is a bit of a different one. It's called Supporting the Buying Committee. Now, we might want to give some context here, right? There was a really good article on saleshacker.com, and it referenced a piece of research by a company called Gartner. It was all about the business-to-business buying process. So not just media, but specifically selling to any business. There were two key stats that jumped off the page, which were really interesting. The first one is this. Over 77% of business-to-business buyers said that their last purchase was very complex and very difficult. The second stat, the average number of people involved in a business purchase decision has jumped from an average of 5.4 people a few years ago to almost 11 people. So what does this mean for us as media salespeople selling into businesses? Well, first of all, it speaks to a broad trend that business in general is becoming more complex as companies seek to spread decision-making responsibility across more people. Secondly, though, it means that we as media salespeople kind of need to overhaul the way that we actually go to market, and in particular, the way we manage a deal through our pipeline. For many people, it's no longer about getting a yes from a client. In most cases, moving forward, it's about getting a collective yes from a buying committee. Our returning guest today is Steve Smith. Now, Steve is the co-founder of Entertainment Strategy Group, or ESG. These guys offer bespoke strategy and management services for the entertainment, broadcast, and media industries. Uh, Jump into the show notes and have a look at Steve's bio. It's probably one of the more impressive bios of anyone in the media industry I've seen. He's been a general manager. He's worked in the record industry. He was a COO. He's worked in the Middle East, establishing the largest media company over there. And drawing on that senior leadership sales and digital experience, spanning across Asia Pacific, the Middle East, ESG work with entertainment-based organizations to provide digital and leadership strategy. So they've got to focus on data and the commercial benefits of true customer insight. ESG helped media companies jumpstart their journey towards being a digitally enabled business and transforming into a business that is reflective of the the times that we're in. What's really cool... He's contributed in the past two episodes, but what I love about having him as a guest is he's got extensive global experience. It makes him the perfect guest to speak to us today on today's topic of supporting the buying committee. The first five. Steve, welcome to the show. Jamie, good to hear your voice again. Well, welcome back to the show, mate. You were one of our most popular guests in season one of the uh, the the Media Sales Mastery podcast. You were actually one of, I think you were the fifth episode and it was a very different time in media back then <laughs> when we spoke last year, mate. You know, before we jump into the topic of buying, you know, supporting the buying committee, I want you to talk to me a little bit about Entertainment Strategy Group. What has the past six months meant for your business and the businesses you're working with? Look, it's been an interesting time for us. I must admit, uh, in the initial stages globally, uh, we had a real uplift in activity uh, as large-scale media and entertainment groups were who we were already working with were keen to try and get projects done and actually get a bit of a blueprint for the future. Obviously, across you know June, July, we saw a bit of a drop-off as budgets came under tight scrutiny, and we, we did see some of our clients drop off or pause. I must say, though, mate, um, uh, across uh, late August, September, we've seen a massive uh, uh, uplift in both locally here in Oz and New Zealand, but also broader internationally of uh, inquiry and, and new clients and our, and our current clients wanting to go back to and resuming uh, uh, the work that we were doing. So that's, you know, you go through these tough times, you'll, you learn a whole lot of new things and, uh, and we're implementing that into our own business now. And what would you say at a, a day-to-day media sales level might be some key learnings for people that are, that are in the industry maybe they're three to five years in, has has there been, I guess, a reframe in the past six months around what what actually best practice looks like? Um, has there been any key learnings you've been hearing from around the world? Is anyone taking this difficult time and turning it into something positive? Look, we're trying to encourage all our clients and, and most of them, so in context, so your listeners can understand, are, are large-scale media and entertainment groups, whether they're 
uh, up in Asia or across uh, in, into MENA or into uh, uh, India, all of them have, a, 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 have gone through a fair bit of pain over this COVID period. But what we're trying to encourage them to do is to use the time to actually set the plans for what are you going to do once we come out of COVID? And what do you identify what you want to leave behind? I'm always looking for silver linings in every every crisis, Jamie. And, and I think this is a good time for businesses to look at how they've gone about doing their business and what is it that they can improve in. But, you know, what is it that they can actually put a stop to that they, they've always known has been something that's holding them back? And we're doing a lot of work in hey, um, you know us quite well now, tell us what you think is actually holding you back somewhat and let's see if we can find a way that once we come out of this, you're never ever going to go back to doing it that way again. We're getting some really great, honest, vulnerability-type conversations uh, between client and, and consultant where we're actually really marking down what's not to go forward and how we're going to do it a whole lot better in the future. You know, it's interesting and it's maybe a little bit, a bit of a weird parallel, but somebody sort of said, think about the immune system of your body. It's one of the few things that actually gets stronger by being damaged, right? So, so, you know, in order for you to build immunity to something, you need to be exposed to, you know, to, to an infection or to an illness. And in many ways, I think that you could draw that parallel to what we're facing in business, that these times and these headwinds have exposed inefficiencies, they've exposed legacy things we used to do that are low return activities. And, and I think if anything, we're going to emerge from this a much leaner, stronger, you know, arguably probably a little bit, a little bit more paranoid <laughs> into, in terms of how we go into the future as organizations. So, you know, it is a, it is really good to hear you reframe, you know, what's been a tough time as a, as a time to, at the very least, take some key learnings to apply to the future. You're exactly right. And, you know, from a, even from a personal level, those that know me that uh, exercise is a, is a big part of my lifestyle. But, you know, I've got a, a, a really great bunch of mates and brother-in-laws in particular in the area we live here in Melbourne. And uh, across the COVID period, you know, we've really focused on, well, how can we use this time to get a little bit fitter? How can we use it to uh, maybe study a little bit more? And uh, But we're, we're all sharing the learnings as well. And I, and I think I'm hoping that when, once we all get together at Christmas time, when we can get together, we can really uh, reflect back on some of the great learnings out of this period as well. I think in the spirit of, of learnings, you know, I've made a point of continuing this podcast. Um, the audience have stuck with me, even though I've been recording from my car and from uh, from home with, with lackluster recording quality. But I really appreciate you making the time, Stephen. I want to jump into this topic because I quoted the statistic at the top of this podcast that the average B2B buying decision globally has gone from being made by an average of 5.4 people to 11 people, right? Now, we're talking broad trends here, but I think reflecting on your experience, and you know, you mentioned it before, leading large media organizations both here and in the Middle East, in ESG, where you're consulting across a bunch of regions around the globe, what would you say is driving this trend? And what does this actually mean for media salespeople as we go forward? I think what we've got to understand as businesses have evolved over the last 10, 15 years is that, and it's an unfortunate thing as well, that sometimes uh, making the mistake on what you purchased has actually <laughs> ruined a few careers along the way as well. So I think there is that um, probably more analysis and less, um, they're probably a little bit risk adverse than they were probably uh, previously. So, and, and I think that's a good thing as well in some aspects in that they are ending up getting the, 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 you know, the type of product that really fits what they're trying to do. But it, it has made the sales component, the sales process, a whole lot more chaotic. Um, I still think it comes back to some relatively, uh, um, straightforward and uh, simple principles that one in particular is that we we know that buyers out there, whether it's agency, well, let's talk from a media point of view or whether it's client, they like to deal with people that they actually like. And I think that's where salespeople get into a robotic function and try to sell, sell, sell rather than actually giving a little bit of an insight and a little bit, and I talk about that vulnerability again, 
giving some insight into who the person they're dealing with as well. And, 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 and having that personal connection, I think, is really important for any sales process. And I think any new salesperson coming into, into the wonderful world of media sales needs to understand is that I think you need to give a little of yourself as well and be able to tell what, you know, what is the person that is going to be entrusted with the, with the uh, budget uh, you're, you're allocating towards this campaign understand who the person is that, that you're entrusting in as well. So that little bit of giving of, of who you actually are is really important as well. Couldn't agree more, and I think it's the perfect setup for the main topic. Media Sales Mastery. When we look at a typical media transaction around the world, and you know maybe there isn't a typical media transaction around the world, but in the regions you guys consult in and that you've worked in, Steve, you know, broadly speaking, can you talk a little bit about what a typical buying process and buying committee might look like in a complex sale in the media environment? You know, specifically, how many stakeholders might actually be involved in reviewing, approving, progressing an opportunity through the company's purchase cycle? And again, I think this has changed significantly, but understanding who, you know, if you've got your champion in your, in there, and, and this article talks about your champion in the business, that's really important. Having someone in there that goes, gee, I, I know Jamie Wood and I trust him and I think we should be having a look at what he's got to, have a listening, uh, listen to what he's got to say is really important. So understanding yeah. who the champion is and why are they so keen for you to actually come into their business. But I think being able to strategically put down on paper who the key decision makers are in the business, so in the actual client's business, yes, make, making sure that we have that great agency relationship at, at all levels is really important, especially when we're talking from a media point of view. But we really need to understand if the CEO is involved in the development of the culture of that business, which I'm, I, I'm assuming is pretty much every successful uh, um, a brand or business out there, the CEO has a major input. We need to understand who he is, he or she is, and what, what, what do they stand for. But it needs to go a whole lot deeper into CMO, CFO, but we need to get organised and get these names and profiles down on paper before we actually start really setting a strategy towards uh, delivering a solution for these for these clients. So getting organised and making sure you understand who's who in the zoo and who's actually making the decisions is really important rather than just relying on your champion in there that's saying great things about you. You know, we were talking offline before we started recording and we, we did talk about one of the learnings through COVID is how critical allocation of time is at the moment. And I think, you know, one of those sacred cows maybe we need to call out is that we used to always say sales is really a numbers game. Activity equals results. But I think we've got a bit of a paradox right now because as the market does become more complex and I've you've seen it, I've seen it, you know, that might not necessarily be the case anymore or moving forward. So, you know, maybe, Steve, could you speak a little bit about what a good client uncovery might need to look like these days to ensure that a media salesperson can actually un uncover who the buying committee is and what that typical internal approval process would look like. So is there a way to to potentially use the uncovery to do your homework and map that buying committee out, do you think? Absolutely. Look, and and the DNA of a great salesperson is that they, they do love meeting new people. I, I haven't met a great salesperson that doesn't get excited about meeting someone new. And I, I'm sure you're the same, Jamie, that, hey, today I'm going to meet the CEO of such and such. Gee, that gets you quite excited. So you've got to have that in your DNA that this is, this is something that you really enjoy doing. But it is actually taking the time to actually understand the, and you're never going to understand it fully, but have some understanding to be able to have a conversation about the business that this potential new client is in. If, if, if this is a, a record company that you're going to pitch about a new release with the uh, tones and I um, uh, coming out, well, you need to understand a little bit about the process of, of uh, music recording and, and, and how an album and a single is, uh, uh, reaches number one. That, that they're not difficult things to be able to find out and learn. So what I'm saying here is it's less about 10 calls a week face-to-face -face and you have to get 10 calls, you have to do 50, 50 phone calls. 
I think it's much more about being a whole lot more targeted, but walking into a initial face-to-face -face meeting knowing more about the client than you probably would have previously five to 10 years ago. Absolutely. And I think, you know, expanding on that point around being able to sit face to face with, you know, the CEO, we are definitely inherently trained, particularly as direct media salespeople, to ensure we're always selling to the decision maker. I think in an agency relationship in a large organization, when it's an enterprise sell, the structure of the organization just doesn't allow that, right? A CEO has finite time in their calendar. They build a hierarchy around them. So it doesn't allow for that face to face. Maybe you know, I'd be curious to hear if you could speak a little bit about how a, the role of a champion that you mentioned earlier on in that sales process, how they can actually help you and how maybe you as the media salesperson can better support and enable that champion to help work your deal through the process as well. Absolutely. And, and, and again, there is so many forks that you can put into a client. For instance, uh, if you've got an energetic CEO of your media organisations, and and looking at the Australian landscape, they're all they're all very energetic from what I can see. Um, use those skills to actually try and connect the CEO of the brand that you're trying to uh to trying to target to connect with your CEO. Start getting more like-minded connections rather than just yourself trying Great to point. get all the connections all the way through. We did this very well. Uh, in the UAE, um, if there was an Emirati at the very senior position within an organisation or, or a large retail group, my Emirati partner, Mahmoud Al Rashid, I would ask him, surely, Mahmoud, you know who uh, Muhammad is in this particular organisation. Can you please go and um, meet up with them? Um, here's the brief of what we're trying to do. And, and, and so on and so on, all the way through the business, you can get different connections that you're controlling because you're controlling the actual sales process. But it, it, it works for such a wonderful, more fruitful, long-term relationship if you can get more, more of uh, that similar level and status actually talking to each other. So I, I'd encourage that as much as possible to not feel like, your own CEO or your own CFO or your head of marketing is not going to be willing to actually come out with you and uh, and meet with their equivalent. It's a brilliant point, Steve. And I think, you know, we don't want to timestamp this episode to be just about COVID, but it's a unique moment in time. And, and I want us to, you know, to really acknowledge the learnings. There isn't a CEO in a single media organization in Australia when presented with an opportunity to, to help a salesperson convert a large piece of revenue that wouldn't be very enthusiastic to have that chat. And that's a resource in your business and it's a tool in your armory you need to leverage, guys. If you, if you have a big enterprise sale and you need a heavy hitter like a CEO or a CMO to pick up the phone to help advance that, ask the question. I think you'll be very surprised by, by the reception you get. Don't use your cookies up without, you know, definitely getting the results. So you have to be select with how which which CEOs you're going to introduce your own CEO to. But it's incredibly powerful when you can get that connection and then uh, that long-term uh, uh, relationship can turn into long-term business uh, from that client that may have only been focusing on that one campaign. It actually, it actually rolls into year-on-year -year succession. It's great. You know, and it's, I was going to ask you about tools or frameworks that might help a media salesperson sort of navigate that process in a more structured fashion. But I want to sort of hang on something that we were going to, we were going to kind of cover off here, which is around, you know, I think a lot of media salespeople think the presentation is, is often the end of the sale. You know, we've done the pitch, they're going to review it, they're going to come back with feedback and we'll negotiate and hopefully we'll get the deal. And I just wonder whether we actually probably don't see the presentation as actually the start of that next sales process in terms of helping, you know, helping that, that champion or that buyer then navigate that proposal through their organization. Have you got any thoughts on how to, how to help a media salesperson maybe identify and track what those key milestones might be in that purchase journey after the presentation? And, and more importantly, you know, the role of forecasting, can this all link up to be a nice big kind of cohesive process? I, I think so. Look, I, I'm a, 
I, I, I love process, and, it, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's kept my life and my professional life on track by, by you know, being, being managed by a process. However, to contradict that as well, sometimes just not always selling, but also maybe even, even just consulting. Hey, I, I saw your ad on TV the other day, or I saw your competitor's ad, they're doing this, this, and that. Not even try, not even on that on that phone call that you put in or that text, trying to chase up on your proposal, but just being genuine in, hey, I'm interested in your business. Here's something that I saw out in the market. Don't always be selling. You know, being a little bit more consultive is without even your client sometimes knowing it is a is a is a breath of fresh air. Hey, I I, I didn't realize. Um, that that was on air there, or or whatever you are able to discover and share with them. I, I I think sometimes we get so caught up in you're right, Jamie. We've done the presentation. It's got the investment number on it. That we've put it into our our pipeline. That's what we're after. Well, sometimes I think you need to think a whole lot broader than that, and and maybe just be a little bit more consultative than than necessarily always trying to have the cap out selling. It's a great point. And, you know, I'm going to call her out because she was a um, a guest on an earlier episode, Emily Davis. She she was dealing with me when she was in a previous role at LinkedIn. Absolute masterful um, sales process of just constantly keeping me engaged with these amazing touch points. And 90% of it was adding just absolute value. She was sharing articles that were relevant. She was giving me great insights. She was absolutely keeping me updated as to how the, the opportunity was progressing and vice versa. But just a really fluid, really, really good example of best practice. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm sure she listens because uh, I know she does. And I just want to call that out. She was She was a phenomenal, phenomenal practitioner of that particular technique. Steve, you know, this is the other one that I think is interesting is we talk about structure and process, but we also need to work on the fly. At what point in the sales process might it be appropriate to kind of bring in other members of the buying committee into that discussion? Is it better to try and assemble them together in a room and just and just hit them all with the presentation so you can, you know, address concerns or questions or kind of get everybody aligned in the room at the prezzo stage? Or is it better to kind of play it a little bit more passive and maybe have a pitch ready to go should a need arise? In the buying process, look, look. I must say, uh, and and probably, uh, I like to have as many of the decision makers in front of me as early as I possibly can in the process, and that's for my own personal sales. You know, from a consultancy point of view, and and we're selling, we're always pitching new clients. I would like to have the most senior CEO in, in, in um, sitting across at the desk, but also the board, some of the board members sitting there as well, because. It's that significance of investment that we we need that buy-in. So for my way of thinking, I think if you can get as many decision makers there initially, but then as you get to understand who's in the room, being able to, if the CMO is sitting there and and, and being able to um, uh, relate the proposal to how it's going to help from a marketing point of view or if the sales director's there and let's face it it's not very often the sales director is actually sitting in a in a media sales uh media sales pitch and at the end of the day if we market uh so much better we're going to sell more product for that client they should be there so getting to understand what the sales unit out on out on the on the road are actually uh getting feedback from their clients i think that's incredibly crucial as well but understanding who's in the room and being able to sway your presentation to be able to relate to each of the individual um characteristics and, and roles i think is really important i i would completely agree and i think you know, we talk about this this concept of buyer uh, committees. We talk about the role of champions, which are kind of your you know your person that can go in and champion your initiative. And I think the one phrase that I want everyone to put into their vernacular moving forward is a thing called champion or buyer enablement. Right. So it's about going. How do you arm your influential people in the buying committee? How do you arm them with tools and support to persuade other people? And I think that's a great point of going, you know, look, 
in order for us to deliver maximum value to you and to ensure that we can make this an easy sign off for you internally, do you have the ability to assemble these stakeholders in a room at this time so we can actually unpack the entire thing, alleviate any of their concerns, hear some of their perspectives on how we could optimize this? We'd, we just feel like this would be a much quicker process and would give you the tools to actually push this through. I mean, I think positioned in the right way, and not being afraid to ask that question could be really powerful. And, you know, the the deals that you guys do at ESG, I dare say, are probably at that senior C-suite level where you've got representatives from CFO, CEO, CMO. But for somebody who's maybe new to this concept, Steve, someone who's, you know, maybe a media salesperson, maybe they're an enterprise kind of sell, like they're selling complex products into complex markets with lots of stakeholders. What might be an easy way just to kind of start on the journey of building competence in this area? Is there something, I guess, that could be stage one? Could it be developed in stages? I think we get back to just encouraging the new salesperson. If they've done their prospecting list and they've identified this particular prospect is a good fit for what we're trying to um, sell out in the market, take the time to sit back. Don't even book the appointment for the next for the next uh, face-to-face call. Do the research and understand what's happening with that business right at this moment. Now, in COVID, it's crucial that once we come out of COVID, you're able to talk about if you're, if you're pitching to a retailer or if you're pitching to a travel group or if you're pitching to someone that is uh, in, 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 in fashion. You need to be able to at least have some kind of understanding of how COVID affected that particular uh, sector and you've got some now in understanding how large the wounds are of, of that particular business. It's really crucial that you're able to talk that. If you're going in blindly and trying to present and pitch like you did pre-COVID, um, I, I believe I, 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 you wouldn't last five minutes uh, if you were presenting into um, myself. I, I think you're going to come off as tone deaf if you do. And I, I think that's a really good insight there to take away. Um, now, Steve, we've kind of ripped through these questions because I wanted to devote a fair bit of this episode to our listener submit a question. I can't ask my sales manager that. The reason I wanted to spend a bit of time on this one, mate, is is this this individual actually reached out to me um, and we did a we did a Skype call a couple of months ago, probably about three four months ago. Um, really interesting challenge that he's got. Um, I'm not going to share anything commercially sensitive, so he's asked me to respect his privacy. So I have to dance around some of the details in this question, but I want to read it to you, and I just love to get your perspective and for you and I to unpack this. So he's written for me. Um, I run my own niche media publisher, which provides content for a very particular audience to assist them in a decision-making process at a late stage of a buying cycle. Okay. So if we can read between the lines here, effectively, it's a very specific type of of content that gets produced for people that are a particular life stage that are looking to make a significant purchase. Okay. Um, our, Our audience proposition is extremely powerful because it's so targeted and is often sought out by an audience that it is, is at the late stage of a buying cycle. We've investigated a number of different sales channels to get our proposition in front of brands, including going to agencies, going direct to manufacturers, and having trade shows form part of our sales strategy. Based on all of our efforts over the years, it feels like the best approach for us is to go to large retailers who stock a number of different brands and see if we can leverage their supplier relationships to then go and unlock brand money. Right, So we're talking about some serious complexity in terms of the sales process here. The question goes on, given there are only limited number of these retailers in the country, and given we have such a specialized offering selling into a complex market, can you offer any insights into how to map out a sales strategy to achieve the outcome that we need to achieve? So I'll add a bit more color and context to this. So this guy is a content guy first, right? Um, Passionate about creating amazing content. Um, passionate about the audience that that he is serving, um, has been investing a lot of his time, energy, livelihood into this business, is passionate about making it work. He reached out to me and just wanted to kind of get my perspective after hearing the podcast to say, look, how do we get our pricing model right? Who do we go to? The real clear kind of, I guess, issue that they're facing is going, 
you've got a lot of different sales channels, but if you want to go and sell into you know, into these big retailers, you need to have a really clear strategy because there's only finite clients in this market. So that's kind of the, the context. Um, you know, given your experience, given your credentials, if somebody came to you with that challenge, Steve, what might your process look like for helping them draft a sales or go-to-market strategy to unlock revenue from that particular pocket of the market? It sounds like they are still a relatively emerging business. And it sounds like there is a load of different uh, channels they could they could uh, they could go down, and a lot of different sales channels. My advice would be is that I would probably ask them to focus on what is the what what is the key uh, channel they they should be focusing on, and really dominate that particular channel. And then from there, and and be aware where they're at in that process. Then then start to really broaden uh, their sales process to make sure that they're heading down other sales channels. But if they're not, if they're not dominant in in one of the key sales channels, I think they may end up being trying to be all things to all people. And I and I I think it's important that they try to to really own one particular sales channel. Look, most of the groups that we represent are large scale, so they're well known and yep. they come with a certain uh, profile in, in the market. Now, sometimes that profile isn't great either, so we have to work on 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 changing that um, perception in the market as well. But it does come down to you know whether it's a specific or it, it, it's it's a broad uh, sale that you're trying to do. You do need to make sure that you understand. Who are the decision makers in the business? And I, I'm astounded how many times we've sat with businesses and and with all the with all the software that's available now, whether it's um whether it's Salesforce or Agile or or, or HubSpot or there's so much out there that can be used to be able to enable you to have a great uh, CRM or a great understanding. Of, of clients in the market. And it's, it astounds me still that even though they've bought these softwares, that some of the, some of these organizations are just not using them to the level that they should be. So if there was any advice to any salesperson out there is if they're available, please use these, use these software systems because it can, it can be the point of difference to you and your competitor. However, a CRM is not going to do the job for you. You have to be the one putting the data in and making sure that you've got all the uh, all the necessary data going in to be able to uh, utilize these software um, uh, um, CRMs accordingly to give you the kind of results that you're going to need to do a greater job than your opposition. It's a really good point, you know, and I think what it what it ultimately comes back to as well is what you were saying before, which is you need to actually do the legwork. Like you need to put the put the put the calls into the organization. Um, you know, try to navigate who potentially the decision maker in a sale like this might be. Set up that preliminary uncovery, but really sort of through those conversations, try to build a bit of an org chart. You know, try to get an understanding of how does a decision like this get made. Who are the people that are involved? Um, you know, could you indulge me a bit and just talk to me a bit more about your business? That that kind of stuff does require persistence, um, and it requires a bit of tenacity, but it also requires a really focused approach. And I agree with you. You know, for even smaller organizations, you'd be surprised. You know, you don't need to go and get a Salesforce subscription or or a HubSpot subscription necessarily, or you could subscribe to the free trial packs. You can actually still find some great online resources that could help you with that if you're early in the stage of of scaling your media company as well. Absolutely, Jamie. And look. All of this is extra work, but it is work that is it. It should be interesting to you anyway to uncover who who the key decision makers are and and what you know what really floats their boat. This this is the kind of stuff that actually sets you up for uh, your career outside of your sales career, where where you evolve to in the future. So uh, I, I I think taking this time in your week to step out of the business and focus on 
actually getting this data down on a spreadsheet or into a CRM or, or even just into your, into your uh, note taking and understand who's who in the zoo, it's, it's going to be invaluable to you as you progress to um, making sure that you're talking to the right decision makers or you're gathering the, the, you know, the, the whole crew of decision makers in that organization that's going to get you across the line. I agree. And I think, you know, I guess to round this one out, um, because there's some great topics there, but for this individual, to my mind, the first thing would be to go, let's get the retailers that we want to target down on a piece of paper. Who are they? Let's then get a level of a profile about them. Who are the most desirable? Who are the biggest? Let's go to LinkedIn. Let's use that resource to help us identify who those key individuals are. And, you know, let's do our research in terms of, of, of that organization, its structure, you know, is there a procurement team? Is there a buying team? Um, is are there state managers? Um, try to kind of create something of a of a rough map of what the org chart is. But then a lot of it's about just picking up the phone and making the call, um, and having a really really clear valid business reason as to why you're calling and and you know who that person or those people might be that you'd like to book the meeting with. And I'll I'll shamelessly plug the episode that I uploaded last week with Jake Dunlap from Austin, Texas, um, from Scaled on getting the appointment. Have a listen to that episode too, because that'll help you get the meeting as well. Steve, you know, you're always very generous with your time. Um, This is a really, uh, you know, as this podcast progresses, we're now in season three, we're stepping up the complexity of the topics we're talking about. But if there's one simple or clear action point that maybe the audience should take away from this episode and apply this week, what, what do you think it might be, mate? I'd love to hear it. Look, I mentioned it before, and I think it's it's going to be needed a whole lot more going forward as we as we go into post COVID or COVID normal, as we're calling it. You're just not selling; you're also consulting. You really the the buyer out there is under enormous pressure. Making a mistake could make or break their their career. So you really do need to take on a few different hats now as you, as you go into this, into the sales process going forward. So making sure that you're, you're, you're actually thinking about the business and how you can help, which is not necessarily going to go towards you making your budget, but can, can really build a, 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 a very genuine connection, uh, with that business. I think that's going to be the key to success. For new salespeople or salespeople that just want to change how they're doing things is to be more consultative than actually trying to always just drive the sale. I think that's a phenomenal, phenomenal takeaway. I'm not going to let you go before you talk to me about Entertainment Strategy Group. I want to know what you're working on specifically at the minute um, and would just love to hear how the business is evolving now that you're back in Australia. And um, I mean, how long have you been back? When did you launch it? Why did you launch it? And, and, and where's it evolved to now? Look, ESG has evolved over the last three years since I, I, I moved back to Australia from uh, leading uh, the Arabian radio network over in Dubai for nearly nine years. And the reason, the reason we, um, I, I launched this initially and I, I took on a partner two years ago, Peter McMahon, who is very much uh, very driven on the, uh, the data connection and the, and the consumer and digital side of media and entertainment businesses and so our our yin and yang has worked very well together and look what what we what we try to bring to our consulting is we don't take on too many clients for instance we we only allow ourselves to have six active clients at any one time and the reason we do this is is that there is three directors in the business and we like to be across all the business yes we use other uh, subcontracting uh, 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 consultants um, where we need them. But you'll find that as a client of ESG, you can get to the founders um, uh, without having to go through too many channels. So we, we've been very disciplined on the kind of clients that we, we want to take on. What, we, what we've learned in our, in our long history of leadership in media and entertainment is uh, is put into practice in our consulting. And from a personal point of view, coming from a broadcast radio background, but also having a very strong uh, music industry understanding and, and, and particularly um, events, 
we've been able to go into these large-scale media and entertainment businesses, you know, right across the globe. And one of the core things that we get back down to most of the time is that they've been really busy and they haven't probably picked up the digital baton as fast as they probably should have. And so we help them fast track that. And that that transformation to a more digital uh, um, uh, strategy is sometimes being um, a little lacking and we we try and get them up to speed as quickly as possible while they continue to do the day-to-day. And that's p- pretty much the essence of our business is that we don't talk in a whole lot of jargon. We don't talk in a whole lot of tech speak. We've led large-scale media and entertainment businesses, so we we know where we've made mistakes and we, we try to uh, relay that to our clients on, hey, don't go this way, maybe going this way is a better option. <laughs> and, we, and we're getting some great results. So that's, that's, uh, that's working well for us and, uh, and we're having a whole load of fun along the way as well. Oh, mate, it's great to hear and I, I mentioned it last time we had you on, but you've built an amazing legacy in Dubai with what you created with Arabian Radio Network. And as a, a former radio sales director for many years, I was fortunate to go and tour the facility in 2016 and and just see what a phenomenally innovative um, multi-platform media company that thing transformed into in probably one of the most innovative markets in the world. So, you know, my my sort of strong kind of encouragement to anyone that's listening to this audience is to jump onto Entertainment Strategy Group's website. It's in the show notes. Follow Steve on LinkedIn. Keep an eye on these guys. Um, and Steve, I know you're a you're an absolute you know practitioner of of helping people in their careers, mentoring, providing guidance. So you know, I would encourage anyone if you want to connect with Steve, much like I did, just reach out to him. Um, he's a, he's an absolute legend. And, you know, again, mate, I just want to say a sincere thanks. Um, it's great to have you back on. It's great to hear that, uh, despite COVID keeping you confined to the, uh, the 5k radius where you live, you've been able to really kind of use this time, you know, thoughtfully and meaningfully. We thank you for joining us today, sir. And we uh, hope to have you back soon. Good on you, Jamie. And congratulations to you too, mate, with your, uh, uh, latest phase. I really, uh, I really think, mate, you're, uh, you're doing great things. Well done. Thank you, mate. It's uh, it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time indeed. You've been listening to Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic, guide the show, and don't forget to subscribe to receive new episodes each week. <laughs>